venous disorders. Um, the first thing in the venous disorders is a varicose, varicose veins. And varicose veins basically means that superficial veins, specifically in the legs, will become dilated, irregular, and tortuous. Tortuous means it's not straight. It's like going zigzag shaped or something. If you ever see this before, like in the back of the leg specifically, you see the veins blue that are dilated, looks bigger than normal, and looks irregular. And uh, there are several reasons for that to, to happen, um, but the most important or the most common cause is increased pressure within the veins. This is the most important one. Um, this will be followed by a problem in the, in the valves or something. Uh, if you remember, the valves will allow the blood to go up against gravity. When the blood goes up against gravity, it doesn't go down because the, uh, the valves are intact. If something happened, something wrong happened to the valves, the blood will go up and then go back down and it will stay in dilating the veins and it will become irregular. So um, other factors will be um, familial, familial tendency. Some people, it runs with families that they have veins that the wall can dilate easily. It's kind of weak. Uh, body mass also affect that. If uh, this um, uh, ob uh, obese people, uh, parity, if, if this lady um, delivered a lot of several times, um, the veins will be congested all the time and this can lead to uh, also to varicose veins. Weight lifting is another factor, risk factor, because weight, li weight lifting will usually increase the um, intra-thoracic uh, pressure, which is going to congest the veins. Um, one of the problems that can happen with, um, with the varicose vein is if ulcer occur on top of the, uh, of the, ve of the varicose veins and, and the part that have the varicose veins, this is called the varicose ulcer. And the varicose ulcer is something that's uh, hard to heal, slow to heal, because the edema that's surrounding the area will compress the blood, uh, the arteries, so blood supply will decrease to the area, and any ulcer happen in this case, it will um, will stay for longer time. Uh, treatment for for varicose vein um, live, uh, elevate the legs so that the blood does not stay in the veins, causing uh, problems like pain and causing. Um, stasis of the blood in general can lead to a uh, blood clot, which in this case is called the DVT, or deep venous thrombus. Uh, there are special stockings that can be used for this to compress the veins, so it's not, it does not dilate as much. Um, and um, there are other treatments, including the surgical repair and other things. This is how it looks like. It will be like this tortuous, coarse, dilated, um, and so on. Uh, two conditions that sound very similar to each other are the thrombophlebitis and phlebothrombosis. Um, these are two different uh, conditions. Thrombophlebitis is phlebitis, and phleb, phleb means veins, phlebitis means inflammation of the veins, that's followed by thrombus, phlebitis, thrombophlebitis, while phlebothrombosis is a thrombus that forms without uh, the vein being inflamed, um, and then maybe inflammation happen occur, but uh, happen um, can uh, I mean it can occur later on, but this is thrombosis without. Um, thrombosis in the veins without thrombus in the veins without prior inflammation. So your clue here is the itis, phlebitis. So phlebitis, phleb is veins, itis, inflammation of the veins, followed by thrombus. While phlebothrombosis is different because thrombus without before the inflammation. And there are several factors that help the development of thrombus including stasis of the blood that I, I just uh, talked about, which is like varicose vein. What the problem with varicose veins is the blood is located in dilated veins 
stasis, it stay in there, it doesn't move much. So anytime you have the blood slowing down, it's not moving fast enough, this gives a chance to the platelets to come together and to make the thrombus. Uh, thrombus is basically, usually start with uh, platelets come together and start to stick together, creating or starting the formation of thrombus. So that's why we, we, we don't have, um, or thrombus does not occur in if the blood flow is going uh, normally or it's going fast because the platelets does not have a chance to come together and stick together and form thrombus. So sluggish blood flow or stasis will allow the blood going really slow, stasis, static, slow, so that platelets can come together easily. Uh, also endothelial injury, the endothelium which is the inner lining of the veins, if it is injured, that will make the surface rough. So the platelets that, that are coming, it can stick to that rough surface and another platelet will come and another one creating thrombus. Um, also increase blood coagulability. If something happened, there is something wrong and coagulation or coagulability, which is the ability to, to start coagulation, increased for certain diseases, it can um, increase the chances of formation of the thrombus. Now the thrombus, um, uh, the fate of the thrombus is also important. If you have a thrombus in the veins, it will go from vein from, from veins to larger veins to superior fair vena cava, then it will go to the right atrium, right ventricle, pulmonary trunk, and it will go to the pulmonary arteries, to the smaller arteries, and then it will be stuck somewhere in the lung, and it will never bypass the lung. And this is an, um, uh, something important to know, that it does not bypass the lung. Why? Because the pulmonary, pulmonary circulation is like a tree. So it goes from pulmonary trunk, which is white, to the pulmonary arteries, which is a little bit smaller, to, to, and then branching, 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 until it goes to the smallest, which is the capillaries. So it will definitely be stuck somewhere and not bypassing the lung. So uh, if, if on the other hand, if you have, uh, or if somebody having uh, thrombus in the left side of the heart, like in the left atrium or left ventricle or something, so now it's already um, in the heart itself. So it will leave and go through the aorta from which it will go to the arteries, different arteries, and it can, uh, thrombus can be stuck somewhere else, all over the body, anywhere else. So remember that thrombus that make an embolus, which is a moving thrombus, that can go stuck somewhere, it depends on where does it, did it start. If it starts from the veins, it will definitely go to the heart and get stuck in the lung. If it started somewhere after the lung, like the pulmonary veins or the left side of the heart or something, it will move down the aorta and then it can go to anywhere systemically. It can go to the carotid artery, it can go to the subclavian artery, um, to the aorta, to the um, uh, common iliac, to the lower limbs. It can go anywhere in the body. So, um, so this is important to know the fate of the thrombus. If it's in the veins, it's stuck in the lung causing something called pulmonary infarction. And pulmonary infarction, infarction is that um, part of the lung, um, uh, the blood supply is completely shut down because of the thrombus got st stuck in a small, a small artery that small, the diameter is smaller than the thrombus, so the thrombus is going to, to be stuck in there, preventing the blood supply to that area of the lung, resulting in pulmonary infarction. Um, also, the presence of that in the, in somewhere in the pulmonary circulation will lead to something called pulmonary hypertension. So, um, the fate of the thrombus, if it's in the veins, it will be stuck in the lung. If it is after the lung, it will be stuck anywhere else. So, if it's in the carotid, you know where it's the source. It's not coming from the veins. It's coming from uh, something after the lung. If it's in the carotid artery, like somebody have thrombus in the brain for, or something which is um, which, which can cause uh, CVA, uh, CVA which is a uh, cerebrovascular accident or stroke where is it coming from? definitely not from the veins it's coming from somewhere after the lung um, whether we're talking about thrombophlebites or thromboth uh, of, uh, phlebothrombosis um, 
uh, the the the, uh, the signs and symptoms usually uh, nothing is actually felt unless uh, until later on you start to feel some burning and tenderness in the legs uh, and other signs due to the inflammation which is a regular stuff like fever leukocytosis uh, the complication will be the pulmonary embolism that I just talked about because phlebothrombosis uh, the thrombus form um, in the veins thrombophlebitis but, but phlebothrombosis, thrombus in the veins without inflammation, before the inflammation. Thrombophlebites is thrombus after the inflammation. In both cases, there is thrombus in the veins anyway. And as I explained, it will go to the right side of the heart and it will get stuck in the lung. And this is called pulmonary embolism. Any systemic embolism, which is anywhere else, it cannot be in the veins. It should be somewhere after the lung. Pulmonary veins or left side of the heart or something. Um... The inflammation of that is um, some exercise. You're not really treating much, but exercise to uh, improve the circulation in that area. Elevation of the legs, so there, there, will, there will be less stasis of the blood, so less compression on the veins. Anticoagulants, this is as a prophylaxis to prevent the coagulation and to prevent the formation of thrombus, or at least to prevent further formation of another thrombus if um, um, in certain cases maybe surgery will be needed now the next part is shock and the shock is basically severe reduction of the blood pressure and this can be to do different reasons and we discuss how the blood pressure is controlled and I mentioned that it can come from the heart that decrease cardiac output uh, will decrease blood pressure. Uh, blood volume, when the blood volume decreases, uh, it will result in reduction of the blood pressure. Uh, the next factor will be the diameter. Uh, the, the increased diameter will decrease the blood pressure. We, dis we discussed that previously. So, um, so, so what's cardiogenic shock? Cardiogenic shock is something like heart failure or something like that. If the heart... Um, was unable or failed to maintain adequate cardiac output, that will result in severe reduction of the blood pressure, which is cardiogenic shock. So it's a shock that's resulting from a problem in the heart, generated from the heart. Hypovolemic shock, if, somebody, if something happened like severe um, hemorrhage or something like that, uh, that will lead to severe reduction of the blood volume, and we talked about this. Reduction of the blood volume, will result in severe hypotension, which is shock. So in this case, you call it hypovolemic shock. Other types of shock are mainly due to vasodilation, which is the next part. Um, uh, disruptive, uh, vasogenic. Vasogenic is uh, the blood vessels dilate for some reason, uh, like uh, a condition that leads to vagal stimulation, which is the parasympathetic. Or, or, or other things that anything that will lead to severe dilation of the blood vessels will, re will result in uh, a severe reduction of the blood pressure. Neurogenic shock is another uh, way um, which is the disturbances in the ner nervous system leads to vasodilation. Septic shock is due to sepsis and sepsis is coming from infection so some sort of infection um, that lead to severe dilation or uh, dilation of um, the blood vessels leading to uh, reduction of, um, uh, of the, of the uh, diameter of the blood vessels reducing the blood pressure. Anaphylactic shock is something else. Anaphylactic shock is due to anaphylaxis. And anaphylaxis is one type of, uh, or a type of, um, allergy, severe allergy, like like this person is have severe allergy toward um, um, toward B. Like uh, if he got a bee sting or something, um, there will be a severe and allergic reaction, including severe uh, dilation dilation of the blood vessels, which is called anaphylactic, or uh, resulting in severe reduction of the blood pressure, which is anaphylactic shock, and that's why those people. Uh, if they know that they have this kind of severe allergy, um, they always carry the EpiPen, which contain epinephrine, and epinephrine is sympathetic, 
so that it will increase the blood pressure or compensate for the severe reduction of the blood pressure. So those here are all in the same category, which is um, dilation of um, uh, the blood vessels. So this is a comparison between all these different types. Hypovolemic is when you lose a lot of uh, blood. This example is hemorrhage, burn. Dehydration is another example as well. When you dehydrate, you're losing blood volume. So hemorrhage, burn, dehydration, all of them, you're losing uh, blood volume. In burns, there is a lot of fluid that accumulates under the burned areas, which cause reduction of um, the blood volume. And we discussed this before, that any time you have decreased blood volume, whether it's lost outside, like in hemorrhage, sometimes the hemorrhage is inside, or, or dehydration, losing a lot of water, or a severe burn that leads to accumulation of fluid outside of the blood. So all of this decreases the blood volume and results in hypovolemia, uh, which is uh, hypovolemic shock, uh, uh, which is severe reduction of the blood pressure due to decreased blood volume. Cardiogenic shock, something happened to the heart, um, leading to the heart, uh, unable to uh, pump enough blood, which is severe reduction of um, um, uh, cardiac output, which is another factor. And the example of that is myocardial infarction, specifically of the left ventricle. If that happened anywhere else, it will not give cardiogenic shock. If it happened in anywhere in the, one of the atria, or even in the, re in the right ventricle, because right ventricle have a little job, a small job which is pumping out the blood toward the, the lung only. When, and the lung is right beside the heart, so there is not, not much effort needed. But what's actually pumping the, the blood out of the heart to the whole, or, uh, the whole body is the left ventricle. So if the left ventricle failed, like my cardiac infarction, part of the heart uh, muscles, specifically of the left ventricle, died. So the left ventricle is not able to do the job. Severe reduction of the cardiac output, cardiogenic shock. Arrhythmia will also lead to cardiogenic shock because arrhythmia, it can go all the way to... Um, uh, no contraction or uh, contraction is fast enough that does not pump out blood and I explained that before. Pulmonary embolism um, can also lead to that because embolus will um, block the way for, for, from the blood that's um, coming back to the heart from the lung. Cardiac tamponade is a term that's giving to accumulation of fluid in the pericardial sac, pressing on uh, all chambers of the heart, reducing um, the cavity or the, uh, the chambers, the, the, the size of the chambers, so that less blood come to the heart, less venous return, or less blood coming to the heart. As a result of that, less blood is leaving the heart. Cardiac tamponade. Vasogenic or neurogenic shock, this fail under the same category, which is vasodilation. And this vasodilation neurogenic means severe pain. Sometimes if, um, if somebody is exposed to severe pain, they fail down, they, they get shock uh, because of sudden dilation of the blood vessels. Uh, An anxiety, severe anxiety can make that. Um, hyper, even hypoglycemia itself can lead to uh, this type of shock. Uh, anaphylaxis, I explained that, uh, which is severe allergy that lead to sudden vasodilation and increased permeability of the vessels due to allergy. So anaphylaxis is coming from, or anaphylactic shock is coming from severe allergy, allergic shock. Uh, like uh, insect stings or something, or um, uh, severe allergy to certain types of nuts or drugs or something, all of these will result in severe allergy and uh, the, um, this will result in sudden severe dilation leading to sudden drop of the blood pressure, which is shock. Septic shock, on the other hand, is also vasodilation, but it's, it starts from uh, infection. And specifically, we need to know that these uh, types of, inf of, of bacteria that can cause this severe septic shock or also called into toxic shock, we need to know details about this a little bit, which you know, we need to know that it's a virulent microorganism that's called the gram-negative bacteria. 
this is the most important one. So gram-negative bacteria, they can release endotoxins, something called endotoxins. And this endotoxin will go to the blood vessels and dilate them. So it's coming from the endotoxin from specifically gram-negative bacteria, which is very virulent. And um, to, to differentiate between septic shock and either, any other shock, there is a clue here that's very important to remember, which is fever. Of course, if you have bacterial infection, you have fever. So if you have shock plus fever, it's a septic shock. Without fever, it can be anything else. These are the general manifestations of, or the early general manifestations of shock. So this person is going to uh, have, develop shock. At the beginning, he will be anxious, uh, pallor, uh, lightheaded, and it can go, um, and, and also sweating and oliguria, all of these, and also uh, tachycardia, and, and, and can go up to um, syncope at the end, which is they fell down because of the severe reduction or because of shock. The, the reason for all of those is the same thing, which is drop of the blood pressure. So blood pressure, when it drops, um, it will lead to anxiety because not enough blood carrying enough oxygen, so it become anxious. Uh, tachycardia, on the other hand, is the reaction of the body trying to compensate for the low blood pressure. So it's trying to speed up to try the best to supply enough blood. Paler, you will be pale because not enough blood going to the skin. Lightheadedness, not enough blood going to the brain. Uh, sweating is also due to the vasodilation, just a reaction. Oliguria, of course, you, try, you have hypotension already, so there is no reason that you lose some more water in the, in the urine because it will lead to even more reduction of the, of, the, um, of the blood volume and more reduction of the already reduced or already decreased blood pressure. So oliguria, your kidney will, will save uh, your, your uh, water, leave it in the blood so you don't lose more volume by oliguria. And oligo means small. Urea is urine. So oliguria means small amount of urine. You don't make urine or you make small amount, smaller amount of urine because you want to save your water so that you don't lose any more blood volume. Uh, so the compensatory mechanisms, we talked about it before here, which is oliguria is one of the compensatory mechanisms. Tachycardia is a compensatory mechanism. Um, vasoconstriction is also another thing. So when you vasoconstrict, um, you, you are trying to compensate for the drop of the blood pressure because we mentioned that vasoconstriction decreases the blood pressure. Uh, I mean increase, sorry, increase the blood pressure, if you still remember this. Um, uh, renin will be also secreted, and I discussed that in details before. Renin activates angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1, which will be activated with ACE, angiotensin-converting enzyme, uh, into angiotensin 2, and angiotensin 2 will lead to uh, secretion of ADH, which increases the blood volume by increasing water reabsorption. Uh, also, aldosterone will increase sodium reabsorption followed by chloride, followed by water, increasing the blood volume, restoring or increasing the blood pressure back to normal. Uh, also, uh, uh, when renin is act um, activate angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2, this also leads to thirsty, you drink more water, you increase the blood pressure. We, we explained that before, I'm just reviewing it. Uh, and also, um, um, vasoconstriction is one of the actions of um, angiotensin 2, and I explained that in details. Now, there is something that we also need to remember, that during shock there will be some sort of acidosis which is low pH. Why the acidosis is happening? For two reasons. Number one, when we have shock, severe, severe reduction of the blood volume, less blood go to the kidney. Um, so the kidney will, get will not get rid of hydrogen. So you develop acidosis. Normally the kidney get rid of or secrete uh, uh, hydrogen in the urine, which is acid. So if you don't secrete it, you keep it which is acidosis. This is one thing. On the other hand, acidosis also develops with shock because if no enough oxygen go to the cells, 
um, they will start to, to do some anaerobic activities, producing uh, some sort of acids, different types of acids. Uh, and this will lead to acidosis. So acidosis in this case is due to two reasons. Low blood going to the kidney, less secretion of the hydrogen. On the other hand, anaerobic activities of the tissues that are not receiving enough oxygen will result in production of acids. Those two together um, will result in acidosis. That is, um, the, that's, a, that's a company shock. And uh, usually when you have acidosis, you will start to increase the respiration to compensate for that acidosis. Uh, complications when the blood pressure goes down that bad, it can basically uh, lead to failure of different organs, including kidney. We talked about the kidney before. When uh, low blood pressure, there are certain organs that are affected more than others when the blood pressure goes down dramatically like this. Uh, number one is usually the kidney, so the kidney can fail, which is acute renal uh, failure. Um, lung can be affected. Um, uh, even the, the liver in severe cases can be affected. Um, other complications, something like infection, septicemia, if this is a septic shock or something, and, uh, and if it's septic shock, it can also lead to something called DIC, disseminated intravascular coagulopathy. Also, the, card, the heart can be affected. But out of those, uh, the, 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 uh, the kidney, the lung, the liver, and the heart are the most to be affected. Uh, these are the manifestations of shock. Hypotension, obviously. And then... Um, the compensatory mechanisms, just uh, summarizing all what we mentioned so far. So there are early signs and late signs. So the early signs of um, shock is you become anxious. I, I mentioned that, anxious. Um, you will have some sort of tachycardia, you're thirsty, and so on. So this is all because of the reduction of uh, the blood pressure. And if that's is progressive, meaning it's, uh, it, 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 um, um, after some time, what's going to happen is uh, blood pressure goes down, which is hypotension, tachycardia, will start oligoria, metabolic acidosis, these will happen. If that continue even more without being compensated, which is decompensated shock, this can lead to um, um, confusion is one thing, but different organs can basically fail like heart failure, uh, kidney failure, renal failure, and we talked about those before. These are late complications. Um, um, and that's it for this chapter.